We praise God that we can worship Him together once again today. It's summer again, and all of us can feel the heat. And some say that uh, this, may, this may just last a month or two months at most and get, even get hotter. How do you feel about that? <laughs> Actually, we don't need to worry. You know why? Time passes by so quickly. Soon it will be rainy season again, and it will be cool weather again. And be, before we know it, we will be hearing Christmas carols in September, and then celebrating Christmas again. And then we realize that a year has already passed again. Seasons come, seasons go, days, weeks, months, years pass so very, very quickly. And when we look at the mirror, we realize we're just getting older. Our time in this world is just so short when you compare it to eternity, forever and ever. Think about that. Forever and ever. goes on and on and on and on. There's no end to it. And our life, our present life now, is so short compared to that. It's like a breath, a sigh. Our life is like a fleeting shadow. Our life is like a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. We're like the grass of the morning, springs up new. By evening, it's dry, it's withered. And one day, we will all have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and each of us will have to give, be accountable to give account of what we have done with our life for the Lord. And we will receive the things due us for the things done while in the body, whether it be good or bad. Now, for all of us who have put our trust in Jesus Christ alone to save us, for those of us who know him personally because we trust him, because we know that we're sinners, we can't save ourselves because we know that only Jesus' blood shed on the cross, his sacrifice there, is sufficient to take away our sins because we believe he rose from the grave and he gave us his Holy Spirit to be with us forever. Because we believe in him, he gave us his Holy Spirit and we're now his children. And we are sure that one day we will be with God in heaven to enjoy forever and ever in his presence. But what rewards we will get when we get there will very much depend on how we live our lives here and now in this present age. So let's live our lives devoted to God. That's what I'm going to focus today, what the Lord has impressed on my heart. And our topic for this morning, live devoted to the Lord. Verse 5 uh, verse 35, Paul says, Now I say this for your own benefit, not to restrict you, but to promote what is appropriate and secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. The word there, devotion to the Lord, literally means sitting constantly, paying close attention to. Will you say that word, devote, devoted to the Lord? Look at your seatmate and say that, devoted to the Lord. It means you're sitting beside a person and you're devoting all your attention to the Lord without any kind of distraction. Now you're seated beside your seatmate, right? You can look at your seatmate right beside you. But because we're, it's a worship service, we're paying attention to the Lord. We're focusing on Him. But this word here means we sit beside the Lord who is actually always with us. He's here beside us. He's in our hearts. And we just need to spend time with him. Just come and sit beside him and let him just pay attention to what he's like, what he wants to say, and just to tell him everything. That's what it means. No? Devoted to the Lord. Devotion to the Lord. David himself was very devoted to the Lord. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. In his very early days when he was young, he 
depended completely upon the Lord. And we know his life. He was not perfect. He was an adulterer. He was a sinner. He was a murderer. But whenever he sinned, he came back to the Lord. And he said to the Lord, Lord, create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Other version says, Lord, make me, make me willing to obey you. Isn't that our heart's desire today as we come before the Lord? To just sit beside the Lord and just spend time with Him, to pay attention to Him. You know, God is always waiting for us to come. And the very fact that we're here is because God has, by His Holy Spirit, granted us grace. And we've cooperated with God's grace. That's why we're here. Would you notice God? Would you notice all the blessings He has given to you? And just appreciate Him? And just give thanks and praise to Him? And not allow anything in this world to hinder your relationship with Him. That's actually the main focus of today's message. Don't allow anything to distract us from our undivided devotion to the Lord. You see, the word <clears throat> undistracted here in this verse means being free from any kind of uh, concern, any kind of uh, distraction. We know what it means to be distracted. When we're driving, if we just pick up our cell phone and dial a number and just pay attention to our texts, we might not see what's ahead of us and we get into an accident. All of us are easily diverted from our mental focus. In fact, going through this message this morning, we might realize that sometimes our thoughts stray away. We might be thinking about what's for lunch or what's for dinner or who am I meeting this afternoon or this evening and all the things like that. We know what it's like to be distracted when we're working in our computers and what comes out is ads, even the news, just a click and the news is there. And we feel we need to read it. We need to read this and that because we need to know. And we feel we're consuming the news, but actually it's the news and everything on it is consuming us. What we, uh, what we see, what we hear, what we experience there, what we online, is actually consuming us until our life is consumed because we're not aware of the time. We just realize time has just passed. So God wants us to be undistracted, especially in our devotion to the Lord. But how does Paul want us to do that? Well, when we read this chapter, chapter 7, we can notice four things that are repeated again and again. And because it's repeated, it's very important. And we found it the first time it's mentioned is in verse 17. Only let each one live the life which the Lord has assigned him and to which God has called him. For each person is unique and is accountable for his choices and conduct. Let him walk in this way. This is the rule I make in all the churches. You see, the first time it's mentioned is, Paul says, you got to live the life which the Lord assigned to you. God has called you and me. The second um, time it's mentioned is verse 20. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. You see, we are called by God. Verse, next is verse 24. Each one should remain, let each one remain with God in that condition in which he was when he was called. And then also in verse 26, remain. I think then that because of the impending distress, that is the pressure of the current trouble, it's good for a man to remain as he is. Remain in the calling where God has called us to. You know, God has called us out of a life of sin, out of this world, to be his children, to be holy, to live a holy life. And that is what the root word of the church, ecclesia, is called out ones. We are called out of the world to live our lives for Him. And He wants us to be fully devoted to Him, fully devoted to Him, completely, unreservedly devoted to Him. In all these four verses that's repeated, 
Paul, gi Paul gives us three things where actually the, the church in Corinth wrote a letter to Paul asking about these things. Three things. Should I be circumcised or uncircumcised? Should I be a slave or seek my freedom to be free? And should I be single or should I be married? Let's take a look first at verse uh, 18. Was anyone at the time of his calling from God already circumcised? He's not to become uncircumcised. No one actually can become uncircumcised. It's a play on words. No? Has anyone been called while uncircumcised? He's not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is keeping the commands of God. Circumcision was only an outward sign. And Romans chapter 2, Paul says that circumcision is circumcision of the heart. It's by the spirit. What's important is not circumcision or uncircumcision, but keeping the commands of God. So if we want to live a life in undivided devotion to the Lord, we must make up our minds to obey the Lord, to keep the work commands of the Lord. Many times, yes, that is what we want. That is our desire. But many times we fail, right? We fail every now and then. Let's not forget to just come before the Lord, ask for forgiveness. Lord, help me to keep your commands. Secondly, let's look at the next verse, verse 21. Were you a slave when you were called? Do not worry about that since your status as a believer is equal to that of a freeborn believer. But if you are able to gain your freedom, do that. For he who was a slave when he was called in the Lord is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when he was called is a slave of Christ. And, and so he says... <coughs> Now, if you are a slave, if you can gain your freedom, do so. But remember that, okay, Ver the next verse says, verse 23 says, You were bought with a price, a precious price paid by Christ. Do not become slaves of men. We are all bought by Jesus. When you meditate on the precious price that Jesus paid for us on the cross, because of his love for us, he gave his life for us. And so he died for our sins right there. When we meditate on that, what is our response? When Jesus gave his precious life for us, are we able to come to God and say, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I praise you. Lord, I worship you. <clears throat> Would we live our lives pleasing to him? To live our lives in undivided devotion to the Lord, we must make sure that we must realize our position in Christ. We are his servants because he has saved us. We, are, we don't belong to ourselves anymore. We belong to Christ. Our very lives, he died for us. He paid the price for us. We are his. Thirdly, People were asking Paul, should I be single or should I be married? Starting from verse 25. Now concerning the virgins of marriageable age, I have no command of the Lord, but I give my opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Verse 26. I think then that because of the impending distress, that is the pressure of the current trouble, it is good for a man to remain as he is. Verse 27, are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you unmarried? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned in doing so. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned in doing so. Yet those who marry will have troubles, special challenges in this life. And I'm trying to spare you that. In other words, Paul is saying, you know, if you're not yet married, if you're single, you don't need to look for a wife. If you can handle it, if you can be single all your life long, then do so. You see, sometimes some, people, some of us are very, we hear people say to the singles, what's wrong with you? you know, why aren't you married? That shouldn't be the case. Because here Paul advises people, you know, if you can handle it, if it's a gift that God has given to you, be single. 
Why? And he, he'll explain much, much more later. But if you can't handle it, if you, if you want to get married, then do get married. But the problem is, Paul warns people that those who marry will have troubles, many troubles in this life. And we all know that because we've been raised up in families. We know how dad and mom sometimes can't get along. Husband and wife, the, the very fact that men and women are different shows that <clears throat> there are differences and it's sometimes very hard to get along. Sometimes there are problems with many, many problems relating to one another, understanding each other, empathizing with each other, problems with the children, problems with the in-laws, problems with financially, how we spend money. All of these things are problems. There was once a man who bought, uh, who hung this calligraphy on a wall and he was very happy because he, when, when, when he would read it, he would read it from right to left, the way modern Chinese read it. Tai Tai Pa Wo. My wife is afraid of me. But when his wife would read it, his wife would traditional Chinese would always read from left to right. Okay, Wo Pa Tai Tai. His wife thinks that I am afraid of my wife, that the husband's afraid of the wife. And so they lived happily ever after. <laughs> but that's not true. Even if you fear each other, we know that's not true. That's just a, that's just a joke. That's not true. Let's, take, let's go on. Verse 32 says, Paul says, I want you to be free from concern. And that's one of the main things we've got to pay attention to. Free from concern, undistracted devotion to the Lord. And he explains, the unmarried man, he's concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the married man is concerned about worldly things, how he may please his wife, and his interests are divided. The very fact that because of marriage, our interests may be divided, but God wants us to be totally devoted to the Lord. But the thing is, even if we're already married, and most of us are, we can choose also to not allow ourselves to be divided in our interests. We can focus on the Lord. Okay, let's go to the next verse. <clears throat> the unmarried woman or the virgin is concerned about the matters of the Lord, how to be holy and set apart both in body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the worldly things, how she may please her husband. The next verse. <clears throat> now I say this for your own benefit, not to restrict you, but to promote what is appropriate and secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. We know from last week's um, message that because there, uh, as Reverend Lou explained, because there's so much immorality, it's better for a man to have a woman, uh, his own wife, a woman, to have her own husband. Okay, that's the rule. But if we're able to have this gift from the Lord to be single, to be totally devoted to the Lord, undistracted devotion to the Lord while single, not to have our interests divided, then so be it. That's the best thing. Our next verse, verse 29, Paul goes on to say, but I say this, believers, the time has been shortened. The time is short, he says. What does that mean? The first coming of Jesus has somehow brought matters to a conclusion in this salvation plan of the Lord. The next thing we're waiting for is Jesus to come again. And so the end is near. And the Bible tells us that Jesus may come anytime and we need to be prepared. So the time is short. But even though many people say Jesus is coming again, and then how come people ask, how come Jesus is not yet here? The time is still short because our life is short. Our life is so short, like I, like I explained. And a verse here in Romans 13 says, Do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. The time is so short. Let us do this. Let us be prepared. 
One of the greatest dangers confronts us is we lose sight of the shortness of time. Jesus tells the example of a, a story of a master who would go to a faraway place and take a long time coming back. And what did the servants do? One of the unfaithful, lazy servants said, my master is staying away a long time. And so he begins to beat his fellow servants to eat and drink with drunkards. Let's not do that. We must live in the light of the nearness of the Lord because he's coming again very, very soon. So let's take a look at five practical areas of application on how to live our lives devoted to the Lord. And this application is actually found in the scripture in the following verses, starting verse 29. For <clears throat> From now on, even those who have wives should live, should be as though they did not. So firstly, in terms of family, how is it that Paul says, from now on, those who have wives should live as if they did not? Now, this is not an instruction to, for husbands to neglect their wives, because in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, Husbands, you are to love your wives just as Christ loved the church, and gave himself up for it. Husband is to nurture, to cherish the wife, not to neglect them. But when we think about this present age, when Paul says the time is so short, it's been shortened. This present age is just, and our very life is so short compared to forever and ever. What are we to do? We're to value the things that we have now on how, much, how long they will last and on how much they will benefit benefit it will provide us. We need to remember that marriage, when we get to heaven on the resurrection, there will be people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In other words, we'll be like the angels in heaven. And so marriage is just temporal. It's just temporary. And so we got to put everything in the right perspective. <clears throat> Have you ever heard the uh, saying, happy wife, happy life. How many husbands agree? Happy wife, happy life. You don't agree? <laughs> you agree. <laughs> happy wife, happy life, right? And so some husbands make it their goal to always make their wives happy. Okay, number one goal. But how is that when the, you cannot do it? When you fail to make your wife happy, then you're no longer happy? We should ask ourselves this question as husbands. Why should I, as a husband, let my wife be the one to determine my happiness? I can choose to get so close to God and rejoice in the Lord, actually, no matter what my circumstances are, whether my wife is happy or not, right? Have you ever heard the saying, happy husband, suspicious wife? <laughs> Why is the wife suspicious? Because the husband is happy and she's not. Maybe there's something going on. But we need to get real and ask ourselves, why should my wife be suspicious of me having something going on when she knows very well that I'm close to the Lord and I find my joy in the Lord and my strength, the joy of the Lord is my strength. As husbands, we got to take the lead. We're, we're the leaders of the home we got to take the lead. So let's not expect too much from our wives, you know. So how can we live our lives totally devoted to the Lord? We make sure not to allow, allow any earthly relationships, even our marriage, our relationship with our spouse, our relationship with our sons and daughters, our parents, or anyone in this world to hinder our relationship with God. God has to be number one. Family is important, but God is number one. God has to be number one. He has to be our priority. Secondly, it's in this area of pain and suffering. <clears throat> Paul says, from now on, those who mourn should live as if they did not. And what does Paul mean? Now, you know of Christians 
who were very, very devoted to the Lord, serving the Lord, loving the Lord, even went to seminary and started serving in a church. And it, because of some kind of trial or pain or suffering, they backed out. They backslided. Our hedonistic society places too much emphasis, value on pleasure, Theref therefore does everything possible to avoid pain. And so many people will do anything to stop the pain, including suicide. But when we look at pain and suffering in view of forever and ever, eternity, then Jesus' words can come true. You know, Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Also, this verse that's always being used, Revelation 21.4, in we use this all the time in all our funeral services. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. For the old order, the first or things have passed away. One day, God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. You may say, Pastor, you don't know what you're talking about. When we're suffering in pain, it, likes, it feels like forever and ever. Yes, I may not know. I don't know. But the Bible tells us very well in Revelation 21, 4, that one day God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. In fact, the Bible says that our tears are in his bottle. He, he keeps our tears in the bottle. And so what do we do? 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18 says, Therefore, let us not lose heart. Even though our outward man, outwardly, we're decaying. We know that. That's why we go to medical checkups every now and then. Yet our inner man, this inner man inside of us, is being renewed day by day. Our godly nature inside of us. Verse 17, For momentary light afflictions is producing for us an eternal weight of glory that far beyond all comparison. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Go back to verse 17. Think about that. Our affliction is momentary. It's just a moment in light of forever and ever, eternity. It's just a little while. And it's light. It's light. It's not heavy as we may feel it. Well, how is that, Pastor? We can always come to God and cry out to God. When we're in pain, pain is God's megaphone. We got to go to God. We got to cry out to God. You know, God understands our pain. That's the reason why. When you think about Jesus, that's why he became a man so that he can feel your pain and my pain. Otherwise, when you come to him, we may not even know he understands. That's why he went so much pain. And he calls us not to give up. It's light, it's momentary. When there's suffering, there's death, there will be a resurrection. It's coming. You just need to wait for it. That's why we have Black Saturday. That's why, we're, we're the, that's why in some churches, they cover everything. They cover the cross. They cover it with cloth that's violet. You don't see, because divinity is, is, uh, is, um, is hidden. You know? God, Jesus, set aside his divinity. He became nothing so that he could face all that pain so that he could be like us. And so because of that, we can come to him and tell him everything. And we know he understands. He understands everything. Verse 18. And so we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. It's so easy to put our minds on things that are seen, especially when we surf the net all day long. Things unseen may just be uh, forgotten at all. Let's not forget 
God has something better in store for us. <clears throat> so Paul says, from now on, those who mourn should m not mourn, should live as if they're not mourning. So how can we live our lives devoted to the Lord? We make sure that we don't allow our pain, our suffering, to hinder us, to distract us from our undivided devotion to the Lord. But we got to make, we got to pay attention to one thing. Sometimes we're in pain, we're suffering because of our own sins. And because of that, for example, if, if someone says something to offend me, if I choose to take offense, if I harbor bitterness and resentment, I myself will suffer. There actually, some say there's only one unforgivable sin. For unbelievers, I believe, it, the Bible says it's a blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's when they say they don't want to believe in Jesus. They, they put to death the, the Spirit, so they're not saved. It's, uh, it's not forgiven. But for believers, there's also an unforgivable sin, and that's not being willing to forgive others. Just like Jesus said, Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And if we don't forgive, Jesus says, we are, our, our Heavenly Father will not forgive our sins. We're going to be chained and put in prison until we have paid the last penny. Because when we take offense, when we are hurt, when we choose to harbor bitterness, resentment, instead of bringing everything to the Lord in prayer, we ourselves will be suffering emotional pain. But we can choose what the Bible says, it is to a man's glory to overlook an offense. And what does Jesus say about it? If your brother sins against you, Matthew 18, verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you, if, you've, if he listens to you, then you have won your brother over. And so let's not allow that pain. Let's come to the Lord and pray about it. Pour our hearts to the Lord. Go to that person. Talk with that person. Forgive. Choose to forgive. Choose to understand. Choose to empathize. Choose to love. Actually, when you think about it, everything in this world that we experience, everything has the capacity to bring us closer to the Lord or farther away from the Lord. Pain or suffering, pleasure, everything. It all depends on whether, how we take it from the Lord. If we run to the Lord with our pain, then it, we can allow that pain to bring us closer to the Lord. The next one is pleasure. God has given us all things for us to enjoy. But why does Paul say here, from now on, those who are happy should live as if they are not? That's the verse there. Well, there are two extremes. No? The ascetics, they teach that all pleasure is sinful, while the hedonists in Corinth, they see that no sin in perverse pleasures. What's the middle line here? What's the medium here? It, Paul is not saying that we should avoid everything which causes us to rejoice or to take pleasure in it. Because actually, everything, what, everything we have is a gift from the Lord, right? It's a gift from the Lord. Nothing is ours. Everything is God's. And, and when we choose to do what the Bible says, to give thanks, to give thanks, to give praise, our verse here is, 1 Timothy 4, 4 and 5. Everything God created is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. And so we give thanks to God. Not just three meals a day, but when we wake up in the morning, before we sleep at night, we give thanks, we give praise. And we take all of these blessings from the Lord. And not only that, God has given us so much. Uh, this verse here, and the next verse says, 
God is the one who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Believe it or not, it's for us to enjoy. And so we can give thanks and praise to God. Not only that, we should be responsible to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and to be willing to share. And so when we're careful to do that, to allow, allow our pleasures and everything that God has given us to draw us close to the Lord because we're thankful, because we're loving, because we're willing to share, that can be something for God's glory. John Piper emphasized, finding pleasure in this life is not wrong. What is wrong is finding pleasure apart from God. All earthly pleasures other than those focused towards God are but passing pleasures of sin. They're just passing pleasures of sin. Imagine this. If you were Moses in the Old Testament and you were raised up in the Pharaoh's palace, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, wouldn't you want to take advantage of that? But this is what the Bible says. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded this grace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking for ahead. He was looking ahead to his reward in heaven. And that's what Paul means that when he says, from now on, those who are happy should live as if they are not happy because we choose not to enjoy the pleasures of sin. We choose instead to be persecuted if, that, if God leads us to, if that's what God calls us to, to suffer for Christ because time is short, because we're looking forward to our reward, because this life is not the end. There's something better in the next life. We just got to wait for it. So how can we make sure that we live our lives devoted to the Lord? We must be very careful. We must always check and see if God is the center of our pleasures. If God is the center, if we give thanks to Him, give praise to Him, and if we share what we have, then God is our center. If God is not the center, then we're living in sinful pleasures and we'll eventually have to suffer for that. Fourthly, possessions. <clears throat> Paul says, from now on, those who buy something should live as if it were not theirs to keep, as if they did not possess anything. We do not really possess anything in the first place, right? Because everything we have is a gift from the Lord. We're only stewards, good stewards of God's gifts to us. What do we do when we receive a gift from, the, from anyone? We say thank you, right? We say thank you. We appreciate and we try to repay the person for what the person has done. And that's the same thing we need to do. We say thank you to God. Jesus gave his life for us on the cross. Very painful death. We say thank you to him. We praise him every Sunday. And we live our lives to be pleasing to him. Not only that, the Bible says our next verse Jesus says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. Why? Because in this life, it's just passing away so quickly. We got to store up treasures in heaven. And we got to be, beware of the greed. Greed is a monster, by the way. If we're not careful, we won't check on it. Love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. We got to be careful that our hearts do not stray away to love anything other than God, anything, any of our possessions. <clears throat> when you think about it, everything we have, you know, all the houses that we live in, our cars, all the bank accounts, all the investments, everything that we have in this life, one day it will be burned up with fire. Everything will be destroyed. Let's go to our next verse. 
2 uh, Peter 3, 11 to 12, everything will be destroyed. Okay, our next one is power, power. Okay, let's go to that, power. Paul says, from now on, those who use the things of this world should live as, not, as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. Those who use the things of this world, taking advantage of its opportunities, as though they did not make full use of it. Because everything is just going to burn up in a fire. The Bible says in 2 Peter, it describes everything will be destroyed by fire. It will melt in the heat. And so how are we to live our lives? We live holy and godly lives as we look forward to the day of God and, and, um, look f and speed its coming. So let's make sure that we use our present life as investments for the future. We make sure that we choose the things in this world that will help us draw near to the Lord. Like I said, everything in its life has the purpose, has a capacity to draw, either draw us closer to God or farther to God. We choose only that which leads to God's deepening His life in us so that we can be undivided in our devotion to the Lord. Have you ever... <clears throat> How many of you have attended your high school reunions? High school reunions? Have you attended them? People say that in the 10th year of the reunion, everybody is more or less 18, 28 years old. You still have your looks. You still have your strength. Your shine is still in your marriage. Your kids are small. They're not yet teenagers. And you're a success. You're a success. You're parading all what you have. But on the 20th year reunion, everybody's more or less 38 years old already. And so your looks, your fitness starting to fade. And kids are now teenagers, so parents are more, a little more humble. On their 30th year reunion, everybody is already 48 years old. You're almost 50. Your looks are gone, and you're trying your best to preserve for the past. On the 40th year reunion, it's pretty now much you're already, almost everybody's turning 60. Everybody looks the same. They have a lot of white hair. And by this time, you've learned that there are more important things in life than just earning money, buying things, going around the world. There are more important things than ju just that. And then in a 50th year reunion, <coughs> is the most tender because people are already almost 70 years old and they're aware, in that reunion, they're aware that some of the classmates aren't there anymore because they've already gone. And so you're downsizing, you're actually not growing taller, you're growing smaller, you, li you can't climb the stairs anymore. And the tenderest part of reunion is in the 50th year reunion when when you sing your school song and everybody starts to cry because you know that there will be no more 60th year reunions. We learn too late what we should have known early. Let us learn early that the time is short, that God has something better in store for us in the next life. And so let's use our life now, each day of our lives, all for the glory of God, in undivided devotion to the Lord, storing up treasures in heaven so that one day when we get to heaven, we will hear God say to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. <coughs> what are the things in this life that hinder me from living my life in undivided devotion to the Lord? Would you talk to the Lord about these things and ask him for grace and strength so that you might overcome, so that you might live your life in undivided devotion to the Lord?
Father in heaven, forgive us for the times when we live as if this life is everything. Forgive us, Lord, when we are divided in our devotion to you, when you may not be the center of our lives. Forgive us, Lord, for the times when we live distracted lives and our days, our, our years are just passing away. Thank you for reminding us, Lord, that our life is short and you may come anytime soon. Thank you for reminding us that one day we will face the judgment seat of Christ to receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Teach us, Lord, to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. Help us, Lord, that each day of our lives will be a day, a new day, where we can experience you, that we will live in your presence every moment of every day, that all the blessings that you have given us, we will always give thanks and give praise to you because we truly don't deserve any of it. And if we are called to face pain or suffering, help us, Lord, to cry out to you because only you can comfort us. If not in this life, we know surely in the next. And for all the possessions, all the things that you have given us, Help us put everything in right perspective. Give us wisdom to choose the things that can help us better our relationship with you. Thank you that everything that you have given us to experience in this life can either bring us closer to you or farther away from you. Help us choose, Lord, to cooperate with your grace so that we may choose that which brings us closer to you. For your glory, we ask. May your blessing be upon each and every one of us. Let's all rise for our benediction. Now may the blessings of the Almighty God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he himself equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom we give back all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of our heavenly Father, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all from this day on until forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Our service has ended. Let us spend some time with the Lord in prayer and go and love one another.